So welcome to Fire Body Evaluating the ROI of Open Source The Real Story. I'm Bernard Golden, and we'll be speaking on the topic. And just as kind of a calibration, how many folks in the audience are somewhat acquainted with open source, but not really acquainted with it? Hey, how many of the rest of you are honest? And, <laughs> and how many are sort of, you consider yourself fairly acquainted with it, maybe work with it in your organization? Okay, so about almost 50 50. Anybody sort of say, yeah, we've done a lot of it and we're really confident with it? All right, so this is the guy to come ask questions. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk about uh, open source ROI today. And I, I would like this, I'd like to encourage this to be an interactive, interactive session. Ask questions during it because there's nothing worse in the world than just somebody lecturing. And that's, both, that's true for both the people in the audience and the person lecturing. So I really encourage you, if there's something that's not quite clear or a comment, please go ahead and stick up your hand. I think it's a lot more fun and it's more educational for everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. What I want to talk about today as an agenda, so I better keep out of the way of the projector, huh? is some open source ROI truisms, some things that probably should be clear, and probably if you think about them are clear, but they bear repeating, just to kind of set the right foundation, the right ground rules for a discussion about this. I want to talk about several different kinds of open source ROI. The way we work, look at it is, I'm mean, talking about this as a truism, but we, we put together different scenarios and kind of use those as buckets in which to put ROI stories, and it's, I think it's a much easier kind of program to try and you sort of put it into those categories, and I think that'll make sense. So we're going to talk about some uh, several. One is homegrown systems. In other words, write it yourself. That's a great tradition in IT. Let's talk about that against open source. Like what we call like for unlike, what we call like for like, unlike for unlike, and then I'll present another alternative. And then finally, kind of conclude with open source ROI of real story. Okay, let's talk about some truisms. On the face of it, zero dollar license fees are a good thing. Now that may seem like, well, okay, yeah. But it's amazing to me how much conversation goes on where people go, well, you know, it's really not so, you know, you have trade offs you have to think about, and you have to consider what. All the payments are and all that. All those things are true. But on the face of it, paying nothing for something is a lot better than paying a lot for something. I think in almost every area of human endeavor, cheaper is better. The sole exception I know of are luxury goods, where, you know, and that's usually about personal, what do you want to call it, personal fulfillment or personal whatever, where you say, I've got a $7,500 Rolex watch. There, you want to spend a lot of money. But every other dimension of human life, paying less is better than paying. So kind of on the face of it, you would think a kind of software that doesn't have any costs would be a good thing. The flip side is not everything is free. And I'm talking about IT systems. And I, I kind of have to laugh because about every three months you'll see an article in some part of the technology press. We need another technology um, set to with this thing. Uh, every three months you'll see an article in the technology press that somebody will announced breathlessly. You know, if you look at open source, the software is free, but there are other costs in systems. You have to pay for hardware, and people aren't free, and you might have to send people for training. <laughs> <laughs> and the sun rises in the east. I mean, those things are absolutely true. It's true that open source doesn't mean completely free systems. So there are other costs that are involved that need to be that you need to think about. When you think about those costs, there's kind of buckets or kinds of types, and, and, and in those costs, there are hard costs and soft costs. And in my experience, hard costs are a lot easier to keep track of than soft costs. It's very easy to say the hardware cost X Y Z, or our license was A B C, or we had to go outside for a resource, a contractor that cost us this much. 
most organizations, maybe all of you guys are exceptions, but most organizations, when you get down to three of our people had to work for four months to get this thing up and running, that just kind of disappears into this kind of vast salary pool. It's, it's hard to keep track of. But all those costs make sense and really need to be accounted for to come up with a real ROI. So focusing just on the hard costs, a lot of times we'll ignore many of the associated costs of the system. And remember, not everything's free. So you've got to keep track of all that. We'll talk about that in uh, the upcoming slides. There is no blanket open source ROI story. People seem to have a discussion about open source ROI that's kind of, it's better than proprietary software. Or other people say, it's nowhere near as good as proprietary software. You know, that's like saying, you know, every, you know, the state of California, which is where I come, is X, or the state of Oregon is Y. There is no blanket story. You have to look at individual scenarios, individual situations. The system you're putting in, the situation you've got, I think come up with a good ROI. So I don't think that you know a good answer when somebody says, what's the ROI in the system? You just go, well, it's open source. It's better. It's better. Or it's open source. It's not as good. <laughs> different project scenarios offer different ROI. So of the kinds of systems, we'll be talking about the scenarios in more detail, but Depending on those, they have very different kinds of ROI payouts. And you should kind of think about that as you go through it. And in terms of kind of major project components, we look at it and say there's kind of three major pieces to any project. The first is the license fees and the maintenance fees. And I think everyone understands that. You write a check once for a license to run the system for how many seats or whatever it is. And then there's a maintenance stream typically that's associated with that. With most enterprise software, that's kind of a mandatory maintenance fee. So there's that piece. There's the IT and services costs. And I've lumped those together because they're all sort of people costs in terms of within the IT organization. Either the people you have working for you or the people you bring in from the outside to put this system in. That's all kind of IT headcount type costs. And then there's organization costs. By organization costs, I mean the cost to the rest of the organization to get going on this new system. So when you bring a new system in and you have to train your staff to be able to use it, that's an organization cost. Or the lack of efficiency they have while they're learning the new system, that's an organization cost. That's the cost that we as IT impose on the rest of the organization that they always complain about. Those costs as well. I didn't put hardware in here because it seems to me that the hardware folks, and you can really talk about net, networks and stuff like that, they seem to be in a race to give it to us. So, you know, hardware doesn't typically play a major role in those systems. Now, so I, you know, kind of as a rough rule of thumb, this is kind of where we break this down in terms of the percentages that get assigned to it. About 30% goes to licenses and maintenance fees. About half of it is headcount oriented costs in terms of putting systems in, integrating them, configuring them, all those kind of building them. And then about 20% within the organization. That's kind of rules of thumb for typical systems. You and your organization might feel that that's different. This isn't prescriptive, this is descriptive. And if you thought, if you think it's a different kind of default, that's perfectly fine. And what I'll say is as we go through the scenarios, you see that actually those can vary quite a bit depending on the scenario. But that's kind of a way to look at it. Any questions, comments? All right. Let's talk about homegrown system ROI. Now, for many of us, this is the way IT always started off. You write, wrote your own stuff. You had your own ERP system, your own tracking system, whatever it is. The great thing about homegrown is you have it your way. It is exactly right for your organization. You get to make it exactly what you're looking for. And it comes at a price, which is it costs a lot to do that. In this kind of scenario, if there's an open source alternative, there's a tremendous payback for that because basically you're able to piggyback on the costs of a lot of other folks. So it's a you're you're able to take advantage of the investment that other people have made instead of making it all yourself. 
And if you, we sort of look at that kind of scenario and the percentages, here I think, can everybody see the chart or see it a little bit? Anyway, the big bars? Yeah, well, basically there's no license cost, right? Because this is all, you're talking about either your homegrown writing it, if you're doing it yourself, you're not bringing any software in, or it's open source, so there's not a license cost. In terms of your IT and services cost, which is the top white part of it, a lot more for this kind of stuff within your own organization. You're paying a lot of money to get this whole you want. You have a lot of headcount to do it. Your, your IT costs are very significant. And then your organization costs are typically going to be a little bit higher with homegrown stuff than open source. Why would that be? So this is the cost of the organization getting up and running on this new system. Well, why is that? If you take advantage of an open source system, not only are you taking advantage of the source that they've written, but you're taking advantage of all the feedback they've gotten from all of the user communities to help improve that, to make it better, to make it easier to use, and so forth. So your organization is benefiting from the cost of all those other organizations that have used it. So your organization costs are probably a little bit lower as well. And so maybe a little bit hard to read, but basically using the homegrown as a hundred on a scale of a hundred, you can probably save as much as 60% on a system going into open source. Now, one of the things that you need to do is define what's a core versus a non-core system. This is extremely germane to commercial environments and industrial industry. Maybe less so with government, I'm not sure about that. But really this is all about, if this is something that is, a, is something that really differentiates your business, if this is something really key to you delivering what you do, if this is where you realize profit, that makes sense to invest and do it yourself because you can garner the benefit out of that. And it doesn't make sense if this is the key way that you make money in the world to use an open source product because then what's your differentiation? The flip side is if this is something that makes you just like everybody else in the world, why would you do it yourself? Why not jump on something that's easier to use? Now, you might say, well, geez, you know, if I'm just downloading this stuff and installing it, why are there any IT costs? Isn't it just sort of really, really inexpensive? I could install it whatever. Right? If you use open source, we recommend that you participate in the community, that you take an active role, that you don't treat it purely as a, as a, from a passive point of view and just take an advantage of the resource. It pays benefits to you to invest and participate in the community, to report back problems with the system that you've run into. You might choose to make some code modifications or bug reports. Those make sense to participate in the community and make some investment in that because that will help that product get better and better for you down the road. So we recommend that if some organizations just think, as I said, you know, kind of very much, oh, this is great, I get it for free, I'm going to take advantage of it. We think you should give back a little bit for your ultimate good. When you're looking at a system that you think about, we want to do this homegrown or we want to have this be our own, open source should be the default choice. In other words, that's our default going in position. Okay. You might look at it and go, well, despite that, this is a core system that you know, is really critical that we do ourselves. Okay. Or you might say there isn't an open source product we need to do it ourselves. But default, you're, you know, kind of this conversation should start with what open source is there for us to use? So that's kind of homegrown system ROI. That's the scenario of doing it yourself. Make sense? Let's talk about another scenario, like for unlike. This might be better titled new for old, but we kind of, well, you know, like for unlike, unlike for unlike, so we kind of keep it this way. This scenario is, I have an existing proprietary product, an existing commercial product. Should I replace it with open source? You know, it's in, it's working, it's fine. You know, should I replace it? Dissimilar technology. So, you know, the classic one here is, and it's the one that everybody pays the most attention to, is Linux versus Windows. Right? So, I've got Windows in, it's running. I've heard about this Linux thing. Should I get rid of all my Windows stuff and bring Linux in? Is that good? Well, as a general rule, what you're trading off is license costs and your IT organization costs. So in other words, you're learning costs within your IT organization 
getting people trained, your transition costs, all those kinds of costs, <coughs> plus the costs you're going to impose on the rest of the organization as they learn to use that new system, versus what am I going to be paying for license costs? And of course, I think later in this thing we use, I talk about using the right time horizon, but if you're thinking on a five or eight year kind of time horizon, you might say, well, there's not just one license cost. There might be two or three bites of that cherry, right? Because they're going to come out with a new version, I've got to upgrade that new version. So keep in mind the right amount of license cost for the time frame. But it's basically a trade-off between the license fees and the, and the IT organization costs. So if you look at this, basically your license costs are going to be significantly lower with an open source kind of thing. You might pay some because you might still be buying support. If you look at the Linux thing, oftentimes organizations will buy from a Red Hat or a SUSE or whatever and actually sign up for a maintenance program. So there might be some, like what we're all call license costs. The organization costs for a new open source app versus what you've got, probably going to be a lot higher. I mean, there's a good chance of that because basically there is a significant learning curve in the new system. And with an existing system, there typically isn't so much of a learning curve. Although I, I must say that it in all accounts with Microsoft Vista, it appears that they're trying to break that rule and make it just as big a learning curve as a brand new product. And then, of course, your IT costs are likely significantly higher because, again, you've got all the costs of training the people in new technology. You're going to have all your transition costs. You're going to have to integrate the new system with all the stuff you've already got. The old system integrated with. So there's a lot of costs that are there. So while this isn't a universal rule, I would say that there is oftentimes a good chance that actually continuing on the path with the commercial product you've got is going to be less expensive than pulling out the old stuff and bringing in the new stuff. Really good ones. So like for like ROI. So this is a new open source system versus an old existing system. But in this case, instead of dissimilar technologies, they're very similar. So a great example of this is JBoss versus WebLogic. They're both a JTWE application servers. They both provide the same functionality. They both take the same kind of things. So they're very, very similar. They're not identical, I don't know if you say that, but very similar. In this kind of case, you can get a very positive ROI scenario. I'll just give you an example of this. I worked with a company, it was a, a kind of a technology oriented company that provided a service. So not Google, but something kind of along those lines. And they had built their system, very elaborate, very high performance system on WebLogic. And had it in, it worked quite well. But eventually they said, you know, we need to really upgrade. And so they had, uh, they did a bake off for them, actually. They looked at WebLogic, WebSphere, and JMOs. And tested them all out and so forth. What they found was, first, the technical hurdle to move it was extremely small. They were able to do it very quickly, not much retraining, not much stuff. So it was very painless for them. From the organization's point of view, they never even saw any difference because the systems really worked the same way. In terms of the finance side, it was incredible. This company was about a $30 million a year company. And the upgrade for BBA was going to be about $500,000. So, you know, that's what, uh, a cent and a half a revenue, something like that? Is that right? 15%? All right, it's, no, percent and a half. So, percent and a half of revenue is a pretty significant chunk to get your stuff to the next level. They switched over to JMOS, cost them fifty thousand dollars, and made that trade-off. So for them, that was a huge, huge win. And particularly for them, they were a young startup company. Having that capital to be able to invest in other parts of their business made a huge difference. So that's the kind of scenario that you can get with this. And so when we look at this kind of graph, you can see that the license costs are enormously smaller. Right? You're just chopping out. The entire license cost, you've got some maintenance maybe that you're paying. Your organization costs are really pretty much identical because you're not really imposing any new change on the organization. And then your IT costs are very similar because upgrading to a new version of WebLogic versus bringing in a JBoss 
not a huge difference in terms of what your IT shops want to do. So, you know, kind of the open source strategy around this is as fast as you can, right? You find, you identify those targets at an appropriate time, and you say, great, what open source alternative is there going to do that? Because that's a great scenario. That's just pulling money right out of your budget, or pulling right out of your spend. And, you know, it gives you an opportunity to go further down your list of things you'd like to do. So that's the kind of like-for-like like ROI. So the first one was dissimilar. It was unlike-for-like. Like. This is similar like-for-like. Like. Let's talk about unlike-for-unlike. Unlike. And this would be a so-called greenfield situation. This is a brand new initiative. You don't have any existing system. This is all brand new for you. So these can be similar or dissimilar technologies. An example would be if you're considering putting in a content management system. You could look at a, company, a product like Interwoven, which is a commercial product, very well established, very well known, very expensive. You could look at a product like Zope. And how many of you are here familiar with Zope or heard of Zope? About maybe a quarter. Zope is a content management system built on top of Python which is a very well-established, widely used scripting language that's open source. They both handle content management and provide all the things that you want, like, you know, this group takes care of this part of the content, this group takes care of this part of this part, you've got security and all that kind of stuff, and you can upload and all that kind of stuff that you can replicate. They both do that. In this, you get a positive scenario, primarily based on the fact that you're not paying the license fee. So you have a big drop in the license fee. Your organization costs are probably going to be pretty similar because it's, you know, we're from IT, we're here to help, here's your new system. And they're going to have to learn it one way or another. So it's, there's going to be a learning curve for the organization. And in terms of your IT staff, we call it, you know, from a base level of the scenario, probably a wash. Depending on the products, one might be somewhat faster for you to get money on or not. But pretty much, you know, as kind of on the face of it as a general scenario, it'd be fairly equal. And if we look at kind of the difference, you could probably say on the order of 30, 25 to 30% is kind of a scenario. If you use these kind of default uh, arrangements of the costs that I outlined at the beginning. In terms of developing an open source strategy for this, you really should assess the ROI, but kind of go into it with a bias for open source, because on the face of it, it seems like a scenario is going to play out favorable for the open source piece. All things being Well, let's talk about another alternative. And this alternative was developed by Navica's crack in-house team of management consultants developed through hard work, much thinking, and labor. And I'd like to introduce you to these management consultants we have on staff. <laughs> these are our in-house management consultants. On the left is Sebastian, who is pretty analytical and scientific. And on the right, as evinced by the headgear, is Oliver, who is tends to be more free spirit and creative. And for those of you who have children, of roughly this age, or have had children of roughly this age, you know that something you do a lot of is read books to them. And one of the books that they came up with is a real metaphor for kind of this other alternative. How many of you are familiar with the story of Stone Soup? Well, not everyone at all would count it. Three soldiers coming back from the front, they've been defeated. They're hungry, they're tired, they're thirsty, they're wondering how they're going to manage to make it back home, they're starving, and they come upon a village, and they say, oh, this is great, we're at this village, we'll be able to get something to eat. They knock on a door and say, do you have something you can spare for us to eat? First, says, who is it for? No, nothing here, it's all gone. You know, we don't have anything that we can share. They go to the next door, they knock on the door, and says, no, we don't have anything. There's nothing that we can 
we can provide a third door, the same answer. And they go, well, obviously we're not going to give you anything here. And then one soldier says, you know, what we need to do is make some stone soup. And the other two soldiers go, what does that do? Get a, big bowl, get a big cauldron. They fill it with water, set a fire under it, and all these villagers go, what are these guys doing? What are those all? And they take three big stones and put it into the cauldron. And the villagers go, what are you doing? They say, we're making stone soup. This is the best soup in the world. It's delicious. It's healthful. It is so tasty. It's wonderful. The person says, well, could I have some of that? Absolutely. Of course we're going to share. But you know what would make it even better? Is if we had some carrots. <laughs> I've got some carrots at home. And they run back and they get the carrots and they put them in there. And the next person comes up and says, I, can I have some? Yeah, absolutely. But you know, if we had some chicken, it would be so good. i got a chicken. And as you can imagine how the story goes, everybody brings something and it contributes to the stone soup. And the soldiers get something to eat. The villagers also get something to eat. And not only what they had, but something that they didn't have before. Because instead of just eating their carrots, they now get to eat something that everybody's contributed to. It's a far richer dish. So, and also, Everybody's so happy that they have this wonderful stone soup meal that they have a giant party and dance late into the night, which shows you that open source is a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> so this alternative, cooperative open source, and really that's a big theme for this conference today, right? These two days, is the value of cooperative open source. And so let's talk about that. So it's a blend of homegrown and open source in terms of kind of the, the payoff scenarios and so forth. It's focused on organizational needs. If you can call it a drawback of open source, one of the things is that it's really very much focused on everyone. It's not have it your way. So if your organization says we have particular requirements, particular needs, the product doesn't show up with those. Whereas homegrown, of course, you can do it exactly what you want. Well, cooperative systems, and I'll talk about this, give you the opportunity to get a system built that's more tuned for your environment, for what you want. So it's kind of like homegrown, but it shares the economics of open source much more so. It also gives you the opportunity to address the typical engineering orientation of open source. What does that mean? Well, most open source heretofore has been written by engineers for engineers. So it's a very IT-centric kind of, kind of set of applications. It doesn't do much for if you run, and I, I know that we're doing some work here, if you are in the Department of Corrections and you run a prisoner information system, probably not, there's no engineer out there saying that's what I'm going to go build because they don't really understand it. So most open source has been very IT-centric, very engineering-centric. Cooperative systems give the opportunity to bring to an open source-like development what I would call domain-specific functionality, domain-specific knowledge. It gives an opportunity to extend open source beyond that engineering orientation. As I said, it gives you the opportunity to be domain-specific or a vertical. So we have a number of different uh, organizations here, stuff like that, Department of Corrections, from actually several different states. I think all of you are going to have an opportunity to participate tomorrow in some sessions where you can start sitting down and saying, how can we work together in those systems? Well, guess what? This is not passive. This is participating in the community. You have to bring your domain knowledge. What is it your organization needs? So every department of corrections is going to say, we do it this way, we do it that way, we want to have this in there, we want to have that in there. And you participate by kind of you know, putting your carrots into the pot. So it's it's less of that kind of, we just download it and use it, and more of the, we contribute. We put in part of the cost, but not all of the cost. And so if we look at the, the kind of the numbers here, guess what? License costs in either homegrown or, or cooperative, homegrown or, or this kind of cooperative open source, no, no license costs, right? They're both free, whether it's open source, or cooperative. Again, with a homegrown versus this kind of cooperative open source, your organization costs probably going to be a little bit higher with the homegrown because, again, 
with a cooperative system, you're piggybacking on the wisdom and experience of the entire user base that contributes to that. So the organization doesn't have all the pain and all the learning curve. And of course, with homegrown, you absorb all the costs, whereas here, you're putting in maybe a piece of it, a chunk of it. And of course, the more widely used that the cooperative open source is, probably the smaller this piece is, because there's more people putting in a little bit. Now, of course, the story of some suit, in a way, breaks down, because, you know, at the end of the day, enough people eat it, the, the, the cauldron gets empty, right? With open source, what's great about a digital good like software is, it, it doesn't empty. There is no cauldron that wears out or, or gets emptied with this stuff. Your, co your copy doesn't take away from someone else's copy. And so, the larger the cooperative group, the more those costs get amortized, the more, you know, you can get more benefit for a lower cost. <coughs> and in a way, I, I wonder whether, not just for government organizations like we have here, but in general, whether this is likely to be a future direction for open source. In other words, how do we take the economics and benefits of open source and bring them into more domain-specific political stuff? And it's been a challenge in the past because programmers, a lot of programmers, they just, they're in love with that doing that, right? They're like artists. I love doing that. So they do it at work, and then they maybe go home and do it. Right? With many, many projects, they start like that. You don't generally find someone who works in oil and gas all day who says, you know, I want to go home and do some more oil and gas stuff at night. That just isn't the way they're built. And so this kind of an explicit, acknowledged, cooperative arrangement is a place where you might be able to start drawing those people in. As part of their job, they would be contributing some percentage of their time to do that. And the advantage is if you're in oil and gas, instead of paying a giant life sink fee to a commercial vendor, maybe you're getting a much lower cost solution that's quite benefit for you. And the med sphere, how many of you saw, well, pretty much everybody saw Larry August and thought about it. That's the perfect example, right? There's an investment being made, and all of these hospitals take advantage of the domain knowledge put in by those folks. So, open source, the real story, the bottom line, the last slide. Okay, license fees are important, but not the whole story. I, that's kind of a truism, but I think it's really fair and repeating, which is, they're a big deal, but you can't necessarily just say, well, open source doesn't have license fees, so therefore, let's go that way. You can use the scenarios that, that I've outlined here as kind of back of the envelope. So in other words, you can kind of go, what, what bucket does this fall into? <laughs> What's it likely to turn out to be? And you use that as kind of at least a, a rough guideline so that people afford. Because what you don't want to do is, before you start doing anything, say, well, we have to have a two-month study on economics. Because in my experience, two-month two studies of economics are really a good way of saying, we're not going to do anything. Incorporate all the costs, both hard and soft. And the hard costs are easier to find, but the soft costs are relevant, and you should try and take those into account. Because those are those organizational costs and so forth. Going back to your point, your point, the, the right time horizon. So in other words, license fees are the gift to keep on giving, and if you use a five-year time horizon, all of a sudden those numbers may look quite a bit different, because you're going to be going to that well several times. Quite importantly, don't reject ROI out of hand. A lot of folks who are involved with open source kind of treat it as a kind of, kind of an ideological position or a belief. It is better. We should do it. And I think that's that's valid, and I understand it. I, with mainstream I, organizations, I think you can't really just hold that position and assert it and expect that somehow that's going to carry the day. So ROI, I think, is something very powerful. And particularly if you use an ROI thing and bring that in as support for what you want to do, I think that really smooths the way. For more information, ordinarily, whenever I speak, my publisher always wants me to push my book so that you know people will go out and get copies of it and all that. You can always go to the company, my company's website, Navicasoft.com. A lot of information there, a lot of articles, a lot of info about open source. And uh, in fact, in the book, I present something called the Open Source Maturity Model, which is a way of assessing open source products, figuring out how mature they are, how right they are for your organization. 
and there's a set of templates on the site you can download and use and so forth for, for your purpose. I know the open source maturity model is, is open source, so you're welcome to do take it and do what you like with it and you know if you need to extend it or something like that. And with that I'd like to thank you very much for attending the session.